Everyone has like a little sketchbook. So the whole idea is we want to do, um, I want to do a little exercise. I do a lot of live sketching and I've done some workshops having people live sketching and doing a little animation and I wanted to do that with you guys here tonight. Um, and I'm kind of turning it back on myself. So um, I know some people here probably draw, some people don't, some people whatever, but um, the idea is um, optimally to draw four things in, in, your, in your book, four little spreads. And then we're gonna do something fun with it at the end. So it could be drawings of me, drawings of your neighbors, it could be random thoughts, it could be something I say, it could be words, it could be whatever you want. But um, you know, optimally do four little sketches, four little spreads, and then we're gonna have, well, at the end I'll show you what we're gonna do with it. So this is a, one of my favorite artists, William Kendrich. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him, but this quote of his is kind of really indicative of how I feel about my life. I'm only an artist, my job is to make drawings, not to make sense. And that would be awesome, but the problem is I, I work in ad agencies and marketing companies and work with them and you know, they kind of require to make a certain amount of sense. So it's always been a little bit of a struggle for me. Um, and I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about that journey and like how I kind of came to reconcile those things and how they were, you know, incorporating art into my work has been good and also the struggles around it. So I did this little sketch to kind of illustrate sort of the um, kind of journey, the path, and some of the things that I constantly struggle with. I work a lot in technology, I always have. Um, I've also always drawn and created art. Um, and I've always worked in commercial marketing. I worked in advertising for a long time, I've worked for some software companies, but it's always been with an end user in, in mind. Um, and people are generally excited when they, have, they bring someone in, they, show, they, they do some interesting work, they do animation, they do illustration, they draw, but there's always kind of a, a downside to it and there's always a little bit of a struggle. Um, and I try to like illustrate this a little bit because the path to get to these end, at the end of these, these um, different kinds of streams and activities is a little bit different. So just give you a little background of who I am and where I came from. I grew up in New York um, and like a kid grew up in New York and, and in the 80s and early 90s, I sort of have a lot of the similar influences. I like to draw, I watched Battlestar Galactica, drew little spaceships. Um, I was into you know street art and graffiti, Saturday morning cartoons, like, all the kind of, you know, they look, they don't look so great up on the big screen, but you know, um, you know, that was kind of the general influences I had, like a lot of other kids I grew up with. I also was really into animation, got into animation. This is one of my favorite videos growing up. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers this, this video, the aha, but I really kind of dug sort of the intersection between live action, this is Beastie Boy, old Beastie Boys um, video, the interaction between live motion, live reality, and art and technology and animation, and that's something that always kind of sung to me, and I've always kind of explored those interactions. So in growing up in New York, I also was really fascinated by water towers. I don't know if anyone's ever spent a lot of time in New York and drawn water towers, but it's something I, I looked out the window to every day, and I've made a lot of ways into my art. But growing up, like, you know, I sketched and I drew a lot, but I kind of, I have isolated a few times for this talk, a few moments in my, like, career and life which have really kind of influenced the way I work how art has kind of permeated my life in general and how I haven't been able to put it aside and also how technology has permeated my life and how those two things have started to work together. I've always been a little bit jealous about people who were able to kind of go to a nine to five job, work, go home, do their art and separate those two things for their lives. I think in some ways it's a lot easier. If you guys ever seen Office Space at the end when he's breaking rocks, I'm always like, I wish I had that job and I could survive breaking rocks and then at night I could go home and draw and paint and whatever. But Fortunately, I have three children and it just never seemed like viable to me. So I've kind of brought those whole things together. When I was in college, I had a teacher named Warren Lynn. As you can see, he's kind of a dour looking fellow. And when I had him in, in school, I went to Parsons School of Design for illustration. Um, he was kind of dour, I didn't love him. He kind of made us do this exercise called the four minute burn. And that was something at the time which I begrudged and a lot of other people begrudged, but as a really kind of a small moment which has kind of set the course of my life to a certain extent. So basically the idea is every minute, sit down, every day, sit down, pick a composition, don't spend a lot of time and just draw for four minutes and then be done. Draw a little square on your page and do it. And at first I was like, ah. Then eventually I would start doing it and like a kid who gets really into his homework, I would start to do like four of them a night and then six of them a night and become kind of obsessed with them. And I would sit around all day and doodle little things that I saw it would be on the train, be sitting in, in my room watching TV, whatever. The next kind of pivotal moment of my time, when I talked a little about the cartoons and stuff, I was into that stuff, but when I, the first time I saw Ralph Steadman drawing, and I don't know if you're, you're familiar with Ralph Steadman, but that was a point where I just kind of totally changed the outlook of my life. It was when I was in college, 
um, I was living in Israel for a year, and the t I was taking a comics class, and the teacher brought in um, Ralph Steadman's, um, he, he had done a sort of book which was based on the autobiography of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And it just like completely blew my mind, the way he sort of, you know, the energy, the motion, the way he characterized people, it just was like nothing I'd really seen before or experienced before, and it just really shook me. Um, and when I started to look a little bit more into Ralph Steadman, and kind of understand who he was and his background and how he operated and worked and learned about you know, his travels with Hunter S. Thompson and the whole idea of gonzo journalism. He would go and travel and kind of really, um, you know, he would be in, in set inside of a situation and drawing fast on site impressions with all this energy. And it really kind of spurred me to kind of take what I started with the, um, doing the four minute burns and kind of take that to the next place. So that was kind of, was all fine and good. When I was growing up, I wasn't really into technology. I had a Nintendo, I had an Atari and all that stuff, but I wasn't someone who, you know, sat around and broke into my high school mainframe on DOS and like changed my grades or any of that stuff or tinkered with things. And it really was pretty computer illiterate until about my senior year in college or junior year in college when I started messing around things. And one thing I, I started messing around with was something called Macromedia Director. Does anyone here know Macromedia Director? So Macromedia Director was sort of a precursor to Flash, which is also now kind of a dead technology. But the whole idea with Macromedia Director, when I first engaged with it, it kind of just completely blew my mind. Because all of a sudden, I could take all the doodles, little drawings, music I liked, characters I made, and not only do animation with it, which I had started to tinker with, but also build in a nonlinear storytelling and have people interact with it in very different ways. So my senior year in college, I took this class. And afterwards, I pretty much opened and closed the computer lab. I didn't have a computer at home. But it was before, that, and I had a big like Quadra 900 at the, at, the, at the computer lab that I tried to stick to as much as possible. It was the best computer in the place. And I would just sit all day, and I learned how to program with it and build with it. So I would add music, and I'd say animation. And it just really blew my mind. Um, and this was 1994, 1995. And this was kind of the dawn of like digital media. Most of the people who I was in school with, you know, we're not doing stuff on the computer. It was, begrudgingly, would take a desktop publishing class, but the whole idea of like digital being like ingrained in the work that you do was just totally foreign. And when I, it was foreign to me as well until I saw this and introduced this and totally just changed the course of my life. Another thing that was big for me was, and I don't know if anyone remembers this, was Adobe Streamline. And Adobe Streamline was important because Adobe Streamline was you were able to take your drawings and vectorize them, which doesn't seem like a big deal now. But for then, it was really the gateway and the gauntlet for taking um, like analog drawings and making them digital, which at the time, really, the two things really didn't mix all that much. And now they have that functionality in Illustrator, but it, it again, seems like a small, minor thing, but it really changed the way I work. Another thing is when I discovered the animated GIF. And this is like the first iteration of the animated GIF back in like 1995. Um, at that time, I didn't make my GIFs in Photoshop. I had a little utility called GIF Builder where I just drag a bunch of drawings in and make them. But all of a sudden, again, this was a, a new, brand new tool which kind of blew my mind and, to be honest, blew most people's minds because nobody knew how you did it. It was like secret sauce, you know? And nobody knew how you made the GIF, even though it was super easy. Once Macromedia Director sort of died out, Macromedia Flash kind of picked up over afterwards. And that was something that I really kind of delved into as well. I started learning how to code, how to, um, how to bring things to life. And I actually started to change my identity almost a little bit. Like, I was still doing art and illustration and animation, but I started to become a programmer. You know, I started to learn a different way of thinking about things, how things, problems were solved, how to build things. Um, and for a while, I got really, really deep into it. And it was the late 90s, and, or, and, and basically, you could do pretty much anything you want if you knew how to do this stuff. You could mess around. We, I used to do websites for Chef Boyardee. There was no brand guidelines. I got out of school. I got a job at an agency because nobody else really knew how to use, create art and drawings and also use these tools. So I kind of found myself in this very unique position. Um, I didn't know anything about advertising. I didn't know anything about marketing. I just went and did stuff. And they'd throw us a little money that was cut out of their TV budget, and we'd kind of go from there. And, and there wasn't a lot of scrutiny. There wasn't brand, I never saw a brand guideline or a brand standard. I saw they had a character, they had a can, and that's all I really worried about. One thing about it at this time also is I could bring my own style into the work that I did. And no one really questioned it. They weren't like, hey, this isn't the brand, this isn't whatever. Uh, this is something I did for Tommy Boy Records, which is an old hip hop label and sort of their greatest hits. And we just kind of thought th stuff up and did it. There wasn't a lot of scrutiny. And it was really a great time. We kind of learned. And it just, it was sort of this very free flow between technology 
the new technology that came out. And I kind of ate up every single piece of new technology that I, that I experienced when I was going through it. Um, and, and art, you know, and I saw it became seamless to me. And it was exciting. And no, not a lot of the people were doing it. Big ad agencies didn't really know about it. They would hire little agencies. I used to go and when I was freelancing to these little hovels in like the west side, you know, late at night, there'd be a guy sitting there in shorts, smoking, smoking some weed, and we'd show him the stuff, and that, that was how it operated. And he'd send it off to the agency who had hired him, and he, I, God knows how much they charged him because they didn't know. Um, and it was really kind of an interesting, amazing time, and I felt like this was my place, and I knew something that other people didn't. So unfortunately, in the late 90s, I think it was around 2000, Apple um, moved from oper operating system 9 to operating system 10. And that didn't seem like a big deal to most people, and it was pretty, it was a lot better, obviously, but the one thing that really bummed me out about that was the fact that Adobe Streamline was no longer supported in operating system 10. And I used to run this little simulator for a while, and it was all fun, but I, eventually I broke down and said, okay, it's not gonna work, I need to figure out another way to illustrate. Because what I was doing at the time was <laughs> drawing everything on transparencies, little ink drawings, scanning them in, and then using Streamline to convert them to vectors, and then bringing them to the computer and doing all this stuff now. I was like, what am I going to do? So I broke down and bought a Wacom tablet. And that was kind of early on in Wacom's technology. This was kind of similar to the one I had. It was big and gray and ugly. And mine was like way dirtier than this, like after five minutes. I remember I finally got rid of it. The little, we picked up the little plastic, and it was just really terrible. If anyone's seen my desk, you will kind of know about such things. But I broke down and I bought a Wacom tablet. And then it kind of changed a little bit the way I approached things. I still drew. Um, I still like interacted in the same way, and I still had that bridge between art and analog art and um, technology. But it just it, it changed my style and opened up a lot of things to me. Ah. And as you see, the, things became a lot cleaner. I started playing with colors in a different way, playing with line in a different way, and it really kind of changed the, sort of the patterns of how I created. Even when I started to do. Um, continued analog art, I just started to look at it a different way. And it was just that little piece of technology and that shift, which kind of shifted me and pushed me in this little other direction. So for a few years after, you know, after I left the agency in, in the early, around 2000, we had this big tech crash. I don't know who anyone remembers that, but in, it went from you were able to kind of work in Flash and do Flash technology, whatever, you could sit and bill $100, $125 an hour almost anywhere around town to the, a time where nobody would talk to you about it. Nobody wanted to do Flash. Nobody wanted to do anything in technology. No one wanted to spend any money. They were lucky if they had a job, and it was just, it was depressing. So I kind of abandoned for a while my sort of, my roots in, in doing interactive work, and I kind of fell back on some other stuff that I knew. I'd gone to Parsons. Um, I knew a lot of people in fashion and in, t in television, and so I went back to doing that kind of work. That was still booming. I, you know, I picked up on my, my knowledge of I used to do silk screening in college and making apparel, did a lot of that kind of work. I ended up staying, um, sharing a studio in Brooklyn with a small film company, started doing traditional TV animation work again. Um, and it actually was great because I started to bring those things back in again a few years later when, uh, when the economy started picking up again and this digital work started happening. Um, I started freelancing around town a lot. I did pro small projects for small agencies. And eventually I found myself at AKQA. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that agency. Um, they originally founded in London, I think, and then San Francisco. And they had just opened an office in New York. And I'd been freelancing with them. And since I had this flash background, I actually, what was interesting is I didn't go in as an art guy. I didn't go in as an art director. They actually hired me as a programmer and a production person. Um, I remember my first job was doing these kind of cheesy um, banners for ESPN, like some little game. Um, and they brought me in to just do the Flash production. There was, this was really early on when Flash started using video capabilities. Nobody really knew how to do that stuff, so it was pretty easy to get work again doing it. So I made these little banners for them. Um, and then they found out that I could actually do other stuff than just be a Flash guy. Because I was known as the Flash guy. Like when you walk into a place, I was a Flash guy. The IT guy, I was a Flash guy. And I was like, well, I'm kind of an art director, too. I know how to do that stuff. I know how to design. So I, um, eventually, I got back into that, and we started working on some fun stuff. And, um, it, and, but the Flash thing was kind of my, my way in. So we started working on Coke. And Coke was a big client of theirs, and we started doing some fun stuff for Coke. Um, one thing I used to love was the loader. You know? And again, this was a place, a point in time in life where this technology existed where you could 
you know, really have a lot of fun with it if you wanted. And I remember there was just a whole industry around loaders. You know, we'd spend so much time, what, what, we'd have a whole meeting, what's the loader gonna be? And, um, you know, Coke, we, we, I must have made like 10 different loaders for their site when we were working on it, it was, it was fun. And, you know, and this was a place that allowed me to kind of come in, um, use my skills, but only, only, and use my creativity in a sort of incognito way. I wasn't really known as an artist or anything. It was just kind of a guy who knew how to use Flash. But I started to add these little flourishes in how to animate, having a sense of animation, which other people didn't, which was allowed me to kind of um, play a lot. Um, and that kind of led me to sort of probably what is probably the, the biggest and probably the most fun project I've ever done in a commercial setting on a large scale. Um, Coke had done a, um, a TV spot. Well, I called it a film because it was only released in, in, under theatrical, it wasn't running on TV, and it was a minute and a half long. And it was this beautifully made thing called the Happiness Factory. The idea was, and maybe you guys have seen it, you'd put a quarter into the machine, and then you'd go inside to the machine and see the, the world inside this Coke machine where the soda was made. And it was all these creatures and workers who kind of developed this really like beautiful, interesting thing. So they had made this spot, and they had, we had won the business to create an interactive experience at the, at the time. And at the time, um, you know, Flash was still, was, Flash is kind of a something for me, which was kind of a love-hate relationship, and it was that way for a lot of people who used it. it. You could do really interesting, beautiful, engaging things, and they continue to improve it, but for some reason, it just never worked all that well. You know, part of it was Steve Jobs hated Flash, and he, I think Apple kind of did everything, put a little gremlin in every single one of their systems to kind of just make it work just a little bit less well. But what was really amazing about this is we kind of took this really big a really beautiful um, animated TV spot and wanted to do something interesting with it. Um, most of the experiences that had, we had seen so far in, in on, this was about 2005, were very flat experiences. Either you'd have animation and it would just basically be a movie that ran, or you'd have um, something a little more interactive but it would be kind of janky looking and, and low rent. And the idea is we, we wanted to do something that combined both those things. We wanted to have a lot of interaction, something you could touch and feel and play with. <laughs> Um, and also, you know, it's going to look beautiful and it's going to run well and it's going to really be true to that, the experience that, that people had when they watched the film. What I, it was great for me because when I was able to then bring in a lot of my traditional animation and illustration, I'd done storyboards, I'd done TV spots, bring that in to an interactive company which didn't really have a lot of people who knew about that kind of stuff. They were digital, they were programmers, but they didn't really know. So we were able to bring all these people together and I was able to kind of help guide this process to build this really wonderful experience. And what ended up happening, this was a loader too, um, speaking of loaders, we were able to create this very engaging 3D animated experience that people could play with, they could touch, they could work with. And the whole idea is you were, we had the concept of you were coming into this place, you were learning about these jobs, and then you're gonna apply and you're gonna get a job there. So, um, what ended up happening is just really was like probably the best team of people that had ever come together. And it's another thing that kind of taught me when you start to work in technology that what's important is to have a great team and a great dynamic, you know, because otherwise you can be as talented as you want, but you're never going to create something at this scale, which was exciting and it worked well. Um, I mean, this thing had a potential to not work at all. It looked cool and not work. We had a company named PSYOP, which is a really cool, do a lot of really beautiful animation, 3D work, working with us we were able to have a budget of probably $300,000 to create all our assets, which is incredible when you think about it. Um, I think this website probably cost, in the end, between everything we did, $2 million, which sound, is pretty insane. At the time, it didn't sound like that much, but now it sounds crazy, because nobody spends that kind of money on these websites anymore. Um, but um, we were able, there was basically everyone who worked on it was very vested in it and kind of bought into the idea that we're gonna spend a lot of time a lot of energy and make this thing really beautiful. So the programmers, myself, the production people, I had a bunch of designers who worked for me who hated my guts because what we do is we take this art and we had to really make it move and flow and work and be functional. So we had to create puppets and little sequences and all sorts of things. Um, and that's part of what I've learned too about the combination of technology and art and creation is that it's never an, a singular linear line that's not full of bumps and pain and anguish, you know, to a certain extent. Um, I've sat in a lot of meetings and agencies and when they talk about process and they're like, 
you know, we've just come through a project and they'd be like, it was tricky, it was difficult, how can we make it smooth? And I'm like, well, it's never gonna be smooth. There's always gonna be some pain when you do something interesting and exciting. Um, and, um, and this was really great and exciting and I, you know, and for me, um, yeah, it was probably the best combination of people we had and, and, and just project that we found. Because when it was done, it actually functioned well and it worked well and people interacted with it and we track and people would spend 20 minutes playing with this thing, which for, you know, is a long time. Um, so it was pretty exciting. But that didn't really last too long and eventually Flash kind of died. I mean, we did some extra kind of, I've done some fun Flash projects since then, but you know, after this kind of high of like the late 2000s where people were spending all this money on these beautiful, exciting Flash experiences, um, the F if everyone's ever gone to the FWA.com, the favorite website awards, they'd have all these beautiful, amazing Flash experiences which would take like 10 minutes to load and looks like they cost, they're all, all made by Stella Artois and they'd be like 10,000, they, they must have had like three or four million dollars to make these sites. But they didn't work that well, and I don't think anyone really used them. So eventually, you know, and I'm assuming a lot of people here are probably working in UX and design. I think the world went enough, a different way, and that kind of affected me a lot. Because it went from being like, hey, we want to do something engaging with animation and motion, to we want to do something functional. And then the word responsive started being used all the time. And the word responsive, I understand the need. And like, believe me, I'm all about functionality and the way things work, and I think a lot about that and business goals, but the word responsive just drove me absolutely bananas because it's basically going from something really exciting and interesting and, and aspirational to the lowest common denominator. I'm sure some people are mad at me for saying that, but that's kind of how I felt emotionally about it. So um, so anyway, so it kind of struck me a little bit, this loss of flash, and I think in my own work, um, I went a little, I like to use the word artisanal. Someone said that to me once, your work is artisanal. And, Basically, for me, it meant I started going back to like materials, you know, and started going back to kind of a more raw way of doing things, less high end. I didn't need a million dollars in budget. I didn't need anything. I can make things myself. I can make them easy. And I can make them, I tried to accept the challenge of this new kind of reality of how media was working. Um, I started drawing on the train all the time. When I lived in New York, I lived in Brooklyn. I used to ride the train. Um, I worked at AKQA, then I worked at J. Walter Thompson. And you know, I'd live in Park Slope, and I'd sit on the train from about for about half an hour every day. Everyone would be, you know, if everyone's ever ridden the train in the morning in New York, everyone's staring at their book or sleeping or playing on their phone, and no one makes eye contact at all, which was really awesome for me because nobody would see that I what I was doing. I would look, I could be standing five feet away from someone drawing them, and there was no sort of um, recognition of what was happening. Every once in a while someone would see, they'd kind of move, slink away or do a little pose or something, but there wasn't, um, it was an easy place to do it. I mean, you had to stand sometimes, you were pushed up against a wall and you had to draw like this, but at the same time everyone was stuck there with you. So it was kind of a, a fun experience. And so I used to do it a lot and people thought it was unusual and interesting and this guy ended up following me one morning. Um, I mean, this was planned, he didn't just show up and follow me. <laughs> and basically shot my morning commute sketching people on the subway. Um, and it was fun and it was exciting and I got um, into a couple of film festivals with it and it was great and you know at the time I was working I think at, at Euro um, which is a, now Havis which is an agency in New York and they had this great big amazing space and I'm like hey can you screen my film there you know it wasn't my film it was a filmmaker can you screen it there and they're like yeah it'd be great and people were like oh we love this and it, it was great, but that, what I did start to realize though is like when they started to see this work that I was doing, the illustration and the drawing, I became again to be known as this person, what it had been years ago. And at the time I was an associate creative director and the whole idea for me was I was gonna be able to go onto any project, lead a team and kind of create something it's compelling that meets the business needs of my clients. But what I noticed was that people started to see me as the guy who drew on the subway, you know? and I. I I actually had people warn me. He's like, my friend said, don't screen this movie here because they're gonna, you know, they're gonna start to look at you differently and think about you differently. You need to, he had the kind of, I'm gonna blend in sort of attitude, which, you know, has gotten him pretty far in life. And for me, like, I was like, well, no, I gotta do it. I can't help myself. So we screened the movie and everyone's like, oh, it's cool and, you know, it's great. And it's, it was kind of narcissistic for me. And I was kind of like embarrassed, but excited at the same time. Um, 
But what ended up happening is that um, he was kind of right, because then the recession hit in 2009. And all of a sudden, you know, people are like, oh, we need to cut some people here. You know, and the only people who are paying us now are the, um, whatchamacallit, the, the pharma, pharma companies, you know? And I had never worked on pharma. That was like the last thing in my life that I ever wanted to do was working on pharma. So, um, and no one saw me as, as being able to kind of go that way, you know? Um, so I was like, well, I have to do that because I have three kids and I have to, you know, make some money. Um, so I ended up convincing them to let me do it, by the, and got by on my, like the, by the thinnest shred, survived like a big call, and ended up working in pharma. And pharma itself was challenging. I don't know if anyone here has ever done pharma, but there's a lot of regulation there. I'd gone working from working on, on wheat thins and triscuits and Heineken beer, which there's pretty much no rules at all, except you can't sell the miners, all the way to... Um, to working on things where you couldn't say two words together without a period in the middle, and someone couldn't raise their hand up too high, or you know, and just when you'd been working six months on a project and you were excited and it was finally to get out the door after jumping through all these hurdles, the company you were working for got a letter from the FDA that said this or that, and they're like, oh, and the lawyer would show up and they just change everything, so it was tricky. But I kind of took it as a challenge and a way to kind of work within a small box and, again, to bring art into it. Um, I worked on various brands like um, insulin companies and, and Claritin and all these things, which were pretty rigid and pretty conservative. But we all managed to be able to get together and work within the small box to bring in something interesting and beautiful, whether it was a little touch of motion and animation that just made the experience more interesting or a touch of humanity and color into a generally pretty blue and gray space. So it was a challenge, but after a while I got kind of sick of it and I decided to move to Austin. And I moved to Austin and I was like, where am I going to draw now? You know, and, and you know, there's no train. There's not a lot of normal street life here in Austin, so what are you going to do? Um, I was kind of bummed out. And I actually sometimes would draw on my morning commute. I'd sit in the car in traffic, like on the Lamar Bridge sketching, hoping that I wasn't going to hit someone in front of me. Because I knew what? Nazi. I know, it's not. I wasn't going fast. I was kind of stuck in traffic, but it wasn't, it wasn't smart. Um, but the first year when I was here, you know, and I, I kind of um, happened upon, I, know, I knew music was a big thing here. Music was big for me when I was a kid, but I hadn't seen a lot in New York in my last few years. But all of a sudden, I was kind of thrust back into that scene. I just started to go see bands. And and one person who kind of, again, changed my life a little bit was Iggy Pop, you know. Um, not because I love Iggy Pop. I like him. He's not, like, my favorite. I'm not someone who's, you know, all over Iggy Pop. But he was great. And I went to see him at the Mohawk the first South By I was here. And, you know, he looked like this. And he's a little crazy. But he moved. Like, you know, he never stopped moving. And I was someone who used to draw people on the subway who never moved at all. So I was trying to... I was kind of, kind of at a loss for how to draw him. And I just couldn't capture him. So all of a sudden, I just did these really, really fast little quick cartoons of him. And I was like, this isn't really what I wanted. It wasn't anything. But then I took them all and just threw them together as a GIF. And they started to move. And I was like, oh, this is something I can kind of do. And it kind of, I was like, and I can't capture him, you know, still. I can capture his motion. And so that kind of spurred, like, me to start just drawing all sorts of little bands and drawing fast, cutting them up, making little gifts. And the gift, which I hadn't made in probably in about 15 years, was kind of reborn. Not that I hadn't made it in 15 years, but there was about 10 years where gifts were just dead. So I go see Big Frida, you know, and like, you know, I, I just, you know, everyone would be twerking and I just would draw and just the motion and, or, or big business or the sleigh bells or whoever. And like just the whole idea, the way I saw things just kind of changed. It went from capturing a, a small set still personality to motion. And the whole idea of motion really kind of started to make its way into my work on a day-to-day -day basis, not just in, in the projects I was doing at work. Um, but that, too, kind of got me in a little bit of trouble, I think, at work, you know? Like, everyone loved it. Everyone liked it. And kind of like, you know, Two-Faced, there'd be sort of like this smile on one side. Everyone, everyone's copacetic. On the other side, they're kind of like, there's a little anger or a little, like, distrust or a little, like, you don't really necessarily belong here. Um, you're a creative director. You're supposed to be able to guide people, lead people. And I tried to sort of cater that image. Like, I did not 
want to make it the Ami show at all. Like I was like, I had designers who worked for me. And my, my thoughts of, as, as a creative director, what I was supposed to do is sort of set a tone and lead my team to create. Not for me it to be for me, but somehow I found myself constantly kind of drawn back into that space, which was a challenge. And I, you know, and I'll be honest, I'm still figuring out how to manage that. Um, although I'll get to that in a second. Around that time when I started going to South by, I kind of discovered someone else who kind of changed the way I saw things. Um, and this is Chris Milk. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Chris Milk. There you go. So Chris Milk is, I guess you describe him as a, a director. He started off, I think, directing music videos and things like that. But he, like early on, kind of found his way into interactivity and was someone who really kind of um, brought the words, worlds of art and interactivity and motion all together in one really amazing way. Um, the first thing I saw by him, which I don't have up here, was something called, was a, a music, interactive music video he created for Arcade Fire's, what is it, Wilderness Downtown, um, or The Burbs, I think the name it. Basically it was a, and it, this was sort of around the time that HTML5 came out, I think 2012 or 13, and what Chris had done is basically allowed you to go in and personalize your information, t talk about the place where you were born, you'd add it in your address, you, and a few other, um, pieces of information, and it would generate sort of a dynamic music video based upon your information, pulling in your map info, but in a way which was really cool and interesting that I'd never really seen before. Um, I wasn't a big Arcade Fire fan, but I like watched it over and over again. But what really struck me that Chris did actually was the Johnny Cash project, which was another piece that he had done. Um, so what this was, was basically he had taken the video, created a video for this, the song um, Ain't No Grave by Johnny Cash, brought it into, created an HTML5 um, program out of it, and basically made it so that you could download a single frame from his video and paint over it and repaint it, um, and then play it back. And thousands upon thousands and thousands of people had done this. And so what had ended up happening is he had created this music video, which was constantly, was generated by everyone. It was completely user generated. Um, and not only that, there, there were so many people who created so many different frames that you could create a style, a, sty a different style to, to watch it and view it with. So you could watch something abstract, you could watch something representational, and it would regenerate this video based upon all these sort of user created images, each frame by frame by frame. And for me, this was like the ultimate like um, combination of art and, and all the things that I was striving for and, and inspired by had come together in this piece, which I just I thought was brilliant. And, and I still watch it today. It's still living. It's probably about five or six years old. Around this time, I started working in, um, at T3 when I came down here. And I got put on the, um, the, the account for Sprite North America. And it was actually a, a pretty cool, interesting project. Um, we, we basically did a number of websites for them, a bunch of th different digital projects, but the, one of our primary focuses was creating Sprite's social account. And I had worked a little bit in social here and there, but um, it was something which I had never completely run day to day. And it was really kind of amazing and interesting because we were able to kind of, for me, what was really great about it is I was able to see how people reacted to our work on a daily basis. We had a really tight-knit team, myself, uh, you know, uh, um, a social coordinator, um, a copywriter, and, a, and an art director, and we just kind of created all the time, made things. We, we put stuff, work out every single day, and every single day we saw how people reacted to it. And what was great about Sprite was, you know, their, their main focus was, was, for, was urban youth and basketball, street art, and a bunch of other things that I'd always grown up and been interested in. Um, but what was really great is we were out, able to bring a tactileness back to the work. I had done a lot of work which was supposed to look very digital and very clean and very functional. And here we were able to do something which was not that, you know. It was supposed to be very human. And the whole point, what I started to really love about social media, was the fact that we were connecting with people day to day. And it, was, it seemed very functional, very, very human, very much a reflection of people's environment. Um, we started making a lot of gifts. We got to launch their Tumblr, and we just got to play. And this, again, was one of the places where, I mean, despite the pain of working for my client, who was tricky as a client, Coca-Cola was a big company, and you know, it'd be one of those places where you'd show up and talk to your client, all of a sudden there'd be somebody else on the phone who you didn't know, and you'd be like, oh no. And then you'd sit in a room sometimes with five people, and they forget you were there, and they'd start fighting, and you'd be like, how can I get any work done this way at all? 
But um, we still managed to play around and do a lot of really fun stuff and experiment and learn. Um, and it really allowed me to, again, this was one of those, those sort of nexuses. I feel like I go, my life has gone in these waves between where they, everything kind of came together and we were able to do some really kind of fun stuff. So we did that for a couple of years. We learned a lot, um, made a lot of cool stuff. Again, it, what was interesting about it, you know, in contrast to some of the work we've done for Coke, is it was actually pretty low end as far as technology. You know, it was, it was using very like sketchy sort of primitive, we made a lot of gifts, which we, I had been making 20 years earlier. You know, um, just a lot of little shooting of, of, of uh, little quick animations using spray paint, basketballs, you know. It was kind of anti technology in a way almost. And all the time while we're doing this, I'm still doing art, you know, on the side and trying to manage that. And how does that kind of tie into the work that I do? Um, and trying to manage the impression. This is from a show that I did um, that actually Shauna curated um, in 2015 in East Austin, um, where I tried to create an experience as well. And I tried to bring the lessons that I'd learned from work into here and the lesson the work I've learned here back into my work. So creating experience, I had animation running, I had you know a wall full of drawings, my music drawings. But again, I was trying to do this work and as an artist, let everyone know about it because you want people to come to see your work. At the same time, manage my sort of image as this creative director. So it was a constant kind of little push and pull and kind of a, a tricky thing. Um, after I left T3, I went to Spreadfast. I don't know if people here are familiar with Spreadfast. It's no longer Spreadfast at this point. It kind of merged into something else now. But um, I came to Spreadfast at really an interesting time. And it was the first time since the beginning of my career I had gone from working in an ad agency into a, actually a straight up software company. But I'd, I just had all this great experience in social media and Spreadfast made social media software. So I thought this is going to be you know, really interesting. And it kind of was. Um, I started there right after the time they had merged with another company called Mass Relevance. And Mass Relevance was almost like an agency a software company. They did these sexy kind of visualizations of social media that you'd see all at South by and at conventions. And um, it was, they did pretty cool stuff. Spreadfast, even though they did social media software, was a little bit more of a traditional software company. They made software to manage your social media accounts, you know, to do, you know, everything from scheduling to, you know, permissions to publishing. So it was a little more dry and the, these two cultures kind of came together and then I showed up and had to be their creative director. So it was a kind of a pretty interesting time. So Spreadfast kind of brought me on for a couple of reasons. They, the, the people who wanted their, wanted their brand to stand out and they wanted to differentiate themselves. Um, and for me, like early on, me and my team kind of would sit around, look at our competition and think about differentiating ourselves. And what we noticed about most software companies we dealt with were three things. One, they had a name which was spelled wrong and then also dropped a vowel. And that was, that was one thing. Um, and then also you could put your hand basically over their logo, scroll down their websites, and there was basically the same thing with two or three different combinations of palettes. There was maybe like blue and orange, then there was, um, maybe a, a red and, and, and white, and then there was maybe a blue-gray combination. And those were like basically what we had out there. And what had struck me, especially working in social media, is the thing that it, we had lost completely in any of this stuff was the human touch at all. Because in the end, we were building software for people. And I had worked in software and, and technology for a long time. And the constant is always the people, always bringing them together. The things change. And, I would see people get all wrapped up in this particular technology or that technology. I'm like, you gotta think the same way about it. In the end of the day, we're trying to create for an end user. Social media is about people's experiences, their real life's experiences. Why is there no humanity at all in our brand? At all. And it's, it's simple, it's two colors. And I understand the functionality of software and that had been a conflict because I designed a lot of websites. Um, in a time when, when websites and marketing had really been a lot more entangled than it is today, where I feel like the disciplines of UX and the disciplines of design have really started to differentiate themselves from sort of marketing and in some ways. I mean, there's tyings, but I remember the first time I heard the word IA. I had no idea what they were talking about. I think it was like 1998 and some woman hired me to do a logo and I was like, what do you do? She's like, I'm an IA. And I'm like, what do you, what's the logo? She's like, I'm calling myself, calling it Hey Hey IA. And for her, that was like a big thing. And I was like, what is that? She's like, well, I do, I do uh, 
um, site maps and wireframes. And I'm like, well, I do that all the time when I make a website. I'm like, I and I too. And I didn't really know. So um, that was just something that you did. And now, it, all of a sudden, it became a completely different discipline. So what had happened, though, I felt is in our marketing side, we had started to blend over the whole idea of functionality and UX, which we needed in, to a certain extent to drive our brands. And I felt like we need to push back a little bit on that because this is about our brand. It's about a humanity. It's about what we do and how we connect. It's not about how we get from necessarily point A to point B. That's in the software, not in the marketing. We did a lot of exploration, a lot of brand exploration, tried to figure out what are people connecting to. I really challenged my team. And again, I had a team and I really took it at the beginning of this, of this kind of journey and spread fast to say, hey, this isn't going to be the Ami show. This isn't going to be me doing my art and everyone else kind of putting it together. This is going to be me leading this team and leading it where it goes. So we did a lot of exp experimentation. We did a lot of research. We played around with a lot of things. Again, use social media really as a sort of a, a, a good kind of proving ground for building our strategy, understanding what connects with people, what they were looking for. Um, did focus groups, all sorts of things. I mean, only problem is when you work in a software company with 500 people is you get five, 600 different opinions about what's cool and what works for them. So that was always a challenge. But what we eventually came up with was the idea of taking real life and taking photography. But the challenge was what do, how do we find photography? How do we um, make it differentiated? Because people will take the same picture I've seen on Unsplash 100 times of a businesswoman who looks kind of hip, or a guy in a suit with a hipster beard and a skateboard walking around, and we'll use that post for any various things, and I'll see it on LinkedIn five different times a day from five different companies. And I was like, we wanted to be intentional. We wanted to make it about us. We wanted to make it so when people saw it, it's like, this is spread fast. And they understood what we were about, and they understood where it came from. And after working through a lot of different ideas, we came up with the idea of using illustration but also kind of rooting it in photography. So combining the two to take the real world and then using illustration to help tell the stories. And I was kind of nervous about doing that because I kind of thought it was going to come back on me. Like, hey, it's Ami just doing illustration again. Um, and I also wanted to create kind of a, a business case for it. So, and also wanted to make it palatable for people. And I didn't want it, not palatable in a way which I'm selling out or make, dumbing it down, but just a way where it's going to actually work for everybody. So we really played with the idea of using illustration and using this kind of idea of illustration and photography together in a, in a way which was bringing the humanity, making it interesting and compelling, but not overwhelming the user. So there would always be um, a lot of space, a lot of back and forth behind it. Um, didn't want to um, overwhelm a viewer with too much stuff. We didn't want to scare people who are a little more conservative with um, too much crazy illustration, too much paint, too much stuff. So we'd, we'd use the illustration, we'd have that come up, but then we'd kind of pull back to a nice kind of quiet, quiet space. So it was always that balance. Um, and this was something that we really drove, um, was driven by our entire team. We all kind of bought into it, really understood it, um, made a point to not do it ourselves. Um, we ended up hiring an illustrator to keep a consistent look. I really wanted to reinforce the idea of brand and that this is a special thing, and it's not just something that anyone could take a Sharpie and go over a photograph and create. So um, we worked really hard to develop it, and there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of sort of um, um, experimentation and ways to kind of set it, and it was a challenge, and working with illustration and working with paint and working with things like the analog stuff is always kind of creates its unique challenges, and some people come to us and say, hey, it's taking too long, or it's not flexible, or it's, the style is not consistent. And those were difficult things to manage. And um, you know, it was tricky. And for us, my, my, my response would always be like, yes, it's harder. But you know, it's making us stand out. If it was easy, everyone would do it. You know? And I've told that to my son all the time. I'm like, if it was easy, everyone would do it. But so the point was that we wanted to be different. You know? and, you know, and I think I felt it was worth the effort, and we got a lot of great response. Our, our stuff was engaged with a lot more on social. Um, there were people who didn't like it, you know, in any place. There were people who wanted blue and gray and stock photos of the skyline of Boston. But, you know, we worked really hard to kind of create something which we owned and was different, and we, I feel like it really helped convey our story, and our, the metrics kind of showed how this worked for us. And, and yes, yeah, so and we started to kind of bring 
I kind of brought in the whole idea of motion and things like that I've been playing with years before, just experimenting with, and started trying to bring it into this kind of corporate setting using animation and motion. Nobody wants to necessarily sit and watch someone talk for two and a half minutes about social media software, or they maybe they do, but whenever you just are scrolling through on, on Facebook, everyone kind of looks the same. So using it as a kind of a, a hook, a visual hook, which differentiated us and draw people in to help tell our stories in a way that wasn't going to get in the way of telling them. So I kind of like thought a lot about this, and I've now kind of brought this, whenever I use my illustration in more of a corporate setting right now, I have a client who's um, a business consultancy in California, and they like the illustration, they like being different, they like the humanity of it, but they also get nervous when there's too much, it's too much and it's overwhelming. So I've worked on really hard on having that kind of point of energy, that point of engagement, the thing that's interesting, and like then letting there be space around it and letting it breathe and not overwhelming, not taking every single UI element and turning it into a painting or taking every button and, you know, or, or everything. It's, it lives in a place that creates the interest and hook and then you do your business um, afterwards. So while it's spread fast, another thing that I kind of got really interested in and, and going back to some of the work that Chris Milk did was sort of engagement, interactive engagement in the physical world. Um, you know, here we were building this software that was about social and I wanted to push really hard the idea that we could bring this, this into the real world and, and create a really interesting experience for people with it, not just have it live it, live on their phones or live on, on their machines. So, you know, and if anyone was familiar with, with what Spreadfast did, they did a lot of visualization work, also had software which could read um, real-time sort of data and kind of convey that. So the display of those things and, and being people being able to add, interact with it and then get responses was something we wanted to do. So I started pitching that. Um, it was always, that was another tricky thing to get done if anyone's ever worked in a software company because the software people are always busy. So they never really had time for a side project and which, was, which was a difficult thing. So one year we actually worked with Argo Design and brought in um, some of their work um, to kind of show, you know, it, that kind of worked thematically with the work that we were doing to kind of help create an interesting experience for people. And it got me really interested in how we could make a more commercial sort of, um, you know, go of this. What can we do with this thing? Um, this was something we did with them where it was just a really simple concept. Again, bringing the real world and technology together using these old big paper books with projectors that you kind of turn the pages. And they would, it was really simple, but they would turn the pages and there was a projected book on it. And so you had the real feel of an of a old big book and that kind of experience. And, but you could digitally project anything in it and it could change, it could be animation. It was like a Harry Potter, um, little Harry Potter um, newspaper, it was really cool. We had like this, you know, just a fun like virtual light air hockey table, which was really kind of cool. Um, and that all kind of led me to kind of start to explore this technology. I couldn't, I was a little bit frustrated because I couldn't make these things myself. How could I kind of create this kind of, this kind of world? How could I create these projects? So. Um, I t decided to go take a, uh, a class on um, Arduino for artists. I don't know if people here are familiar with Arduinos or microcontrollers. Little computers can do little things. In a way, they're pretty, they seem pretty primitive compared to some of the stuff you have today. But to me, they were super tactile and super fun, and I was super psyched to work on it. So I took this class and, you know, with an idea of just kind of creating some sort of fun human interaction. And you can't hear the yell because I turned off the volume. But this is what I created. Basically, a little character, um, when you scream at it, you let your anger out, and it kind of animates up. And this is the Maker Fair last year. Um, and it's pretty rudimentary. You can see it's kind of pushed together with pins and all this stuff. But it kind of, for the first time, I was able to kind of build this piece of physical computing, which really got me excited. And there's nothing better than sitting and watching people scream at something in an empty room. It was really amazing. I have like. 20 or 30 minutes just of people yelling at this thing, and it's just the best, it's awesome. I love to watch, my, this is my son, he was just yelling at it over and over again. He loved it. Um, so this was exciting, and this was really exciting for me. And, and since I've now left Spreadfast, I've started to explore this a little bit more. Oops. Um, how can I play with interacting? How can I have people you know, play with things that I've created in the real world? I started playing with projection as well. Um, this was last year at East um, in the Museum of Human Achievement. I started playing with the idea of like, how could people create something with themselves using projection? I 
by accident, I, this woman had been stood in front of one of the projections, one of the projection shows we had done. And I just loved the way the V looks on the back of her jacket. So I started creating these, basically these skins for people um, where they could set back, take selfies, create something out of themselves, just seeing the ways that light in, in, interacted with people's bodies. Started building little pieces using iPads in the back, you know, physical pieces out in the real world that hang up here and there. You know, really simple little animation, um, but just kind of creating and bringing that digital into the physical space in a, really, in a way which was a little bit different for me. Um, and doing all this stuff, I actually hooked up with, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Data Geek, but Data Geek is a, they run the courses. And through that, I um, ended up um, in this new thing called Hopscotch, which is a, it's similar sort of to um, uh, a Meow Wolf type of experience that's gonna be happening. So I'm excited, I'm working on something for that piece, and that's gonna launch next month as well. But basically, it's gonna be a whole, whole room full of just these interactive pieces where we can play with. And for me, it's still kind of this exploration. And for me, it seems like a cycle where I've taken, for instance, the illustration, turned it into animation. That was a play thing, brought it into my work, brought it into a professional setting. So I'm, I'm really excited about it and hopeful that this is something I can bring in to the next, and into a space in the next place. And recently, I left Spreadfast, actually about a year ago. Um, and now I'm doing something called, I've dubbed Gonzo Viz. So going back to my original idea of Gonzo journalism inspired by Ralph Steadman, the idea of taking my drawing, my live drawing, and trying to make a business out of it. And that's something that, um, and, and the animation. And so um, I did this for a long time for as a sort of a side gig. And it just kind of, to me, it just felt like the time. Like it had finally like it had matured. And I was able to feel built, people started to respond to the content I created in a way which it found its way into a commercial um, in use, and it was exciting. And I kind of, after going through the same idea of justifying who I was, year in and year out, being a creative director, saying I'm a creative director, not an artist, expressing myself or doing this thing, I was able to now just do this and be okay with it, you know, and, and go into a situation and say, hey, this is what I do. If you like it, if you're compelled with it, buy it, we'll do work together, you know? as opposed to being like, I can do this, but it's not really me, and I'm gonna think about a lot of different positions and whatever, so it's really actually been kind of an interesting thing to explore. And for the first time, I think, in my career, where my main focus is doing the work that I do and being recognized for it and, and you know, hopefully you know, solving people's business problems with it and doing something which is exciting to them and successful and, and interesting. So yeah, so I, I do like live painting now on site and I'll do it big and large and people watch the process of it being created, which is really, for them it's exciting, especially most of the time they're drinking, so it makes it a little bit better. But um, people love to see themselves painted, they see their, their friends painted. I also recently started painting on my iPad and doing, using that as a sort of a tool. Another thing which actually has really changed the way I work in a lot of ways, I kind of paint and draw similarly on the iPad as I do with paint and pencils and pens on paper, but I do it in about a quarter of the time. And it allows me to, to do things that I probably would not be able to do, like making animation in a way which is cost effective for people, because animation is expensive. So when I cut down all the production time from having to use an analog process, it helps me kind of create and express myself and also get back to the idea of just living as an artist and creating all the time and having the tools that, and freedom to do that without having physical barriers or time barriers. But I still paint and stuff too, you know, so. Um, so it's kind of, it's really come to a great point where all these things that I've been doing for such a long time, I feel like they're kind of coming together again in a way which is, you know, interesting to me. It's scary because I'm out on my own doing my own thing, but at the same time, I feel like I don't have to make apologies for who I am anymore and I think it's a great place, you know, and, and when people engage and, and it feels really genuine. Um, so it's exciting. And so, like, I don't know, I just wanted to kind of go through this and encourage people to kind of, um, you know, whoever their lives, if, if you guys are working in, in brand or if you guys work with artists or you have, whatever you do, you know, consider, you know, or if you're artists, consider working together as artists. Um, but and just learn how to do that and expect a little bit of different things. Expect things not to go necessarily in a linear fashion all the time and be okay with that. Um, Come into it with a shared vision. If you are working with an artist or if you're an artist working with a brand, 
I think it's, what's really important is that you guys have a shared vision. Be who you are as an artist, and as a brand kind of working with artists, accept who they are and make sure that it, it lines up with what you want to be. And when you work together and you have that, that kind of shared vision and shared understanding for things and shared ownership, it's really kind of an amazing place to be. And, and I actually, every year I go to, when I go to East, I always walk around and I think about all the artists who live here in town, who people can engage with, and why there aren't more brands, all the technology brands in this, country, in this town, engaging with these, these people who are doing really amazing work right under your, under your nose. And just don't be afraid of them. There's this guy, Bill Tavis, who does these really amazing paintings. You might have seen them around town. And he's also someone who's very hooked up into technology, who codes really interesting visual experiences. Um, there's this woman, Flip Solomon, who I know, who does these really beautiful, large-scale paintings and prints that really like, in invoke a lot of emotion and really a dream state. Sarah Vanderbeek is a friend of mine, and she does these really kind of colorful, beautiful paintings. She does a lot of people hire them to paint sneakers and really colorful shirts and, you know, MJ Haha is an anime, another animator who does a lot of music videos in town and creates these really kind of fun, um, eclectic pieces that, you know, are super engaging. Emacio Eagle, he was the guy who we used, who actually illustrated um, when I worked at Spreadfast for us. And he does these really just beautiful watercolors with so much energy and texture. And all these people, you know, create the work because they love it, but they also, you know, are working artists. And I, for me personally, part of my goal in life and part of bringing all together and talking about this is bringing these people together and seeing how this kind of work and technology and design can all work together in a really streamless, seamless way. Karen Woodward is a woman who builds these really fun little figurines and paintings with light. Um, Ryan Montgomery builds these beautiful textured pieces. Yara, who's sitting over there, does these really beautiful, well-rendered drawings of, of people. So. All I can say is basically I would want everyone here to kind of like take away is like engage with people, engage with artists, don't be afraid of them, explore. We have a lot of great artists in this town. If you're an artist, I think encourage you to reach out to people in technology and in marketing and see what you can do with your work because I think there's an opportunity really to help live this life um, fully and, and really make the whole landscape just a lot more, a lot richer and a lot more exciting. Thank you. Thank you.